here. Um, this was really a collective work, and uh, without any of them, uh, this wouldn't have happened in the same way. So um, this is a quite long work that took place over the last three years. And the idea is, um, is coming from the, the following fact. If you look at the situation around concerning uh, 3D dimensional uh, crystal structures, they are very well known. You have hundreds of thousands of them that are populating databases. So at least the structural parameters are very well known and even more properties. And comparatively, com comparatively uh, 2D materials are uh, still a, a, a very fast evolving field, but where you don't know so much, we, we know maybe a few dozens of them. So uh, the idea here is to try to, to, to fill this knowledge gap. And um, uh, if we imagine now we have such a 2D materials database with, with a number of quantities inside, we could think of uh, uh, doing high throughput screening, so looking, for instance, for high mobility materials, ionic conductors, catalysts, topological insulators, piezoelectric, ferroelectric uh, materials, superconductors, spintronics materials, or porous membranes. So those are some of them we're already beginning to do it in, in the lab. Others are at the state of project. And even you could also build a property database with a quantity like thermomechanical properties, stability, or electronic magnetic. And uh, this in itself also has a, has a big value. So that's what we are trying to do. And, and the method is to try to exfoliate uh, uh, compounds that are known experimentally from their 3D structures, where the 3D structure is known. So we, we, begin, we began with external databases, like the ICSD and COD. And we look for structure that looks like this. So with a certain screening algorithm that I, will, that I will describe, we really want to see gaps, if you want, between some layers. So when we have uh, found them, we want to put a little bit more physics inside. So we then turn to DFT calculation, first to relax those 3D structure, and then to compute the energy between those layers to make sure these are really weakly bonded. And from that, we can filter even further and get our 2D database, which we can populate with properties, so electronic magnetic properties, phonons, and uh, eventually topological phases. So let me begin with, uh, with the algorithm to, to screen those, uh, those layered materials. So the idea is fairly simple. You have an initial structure. I, I draw it in 2D here, but you have to imagine a 3D one. Uh, you build a supercell, and then you try to identify atoms that are chemically connected. And our definition of chemical connection is just based on interatomic distances. So you look for atoms for which the distance between them is smaller than a certain value that is given by the sum of van der Waals radii minus some quantity delta. So the idea behind is this plot here from, from, from this reference, essentially, when you look at the distribution of interatomic distance in, in uh, all kinds of structures that contain this dimer, you have a peak of chemical bonds here, most of the time covalent bonds, but it can also be other kinds of strong bonds. And you have another peak that is made of van der Waals bonds. And in between, you have most of the time a gap that we call the van der Waals gap. So the idea here is that you want to be sufficiently further from the van der Waals peak to be sure that really uh, you are inside a, a, a peak of chemically bonded things. So uh, you are sure that they are really chemically connected. So when you have found those, uh, those groups of connected atoms, uh, you want to know if it's 2D or not. And the idea is fairly simple again. You just look for periodic copies of a given atoms because you are inside a supercell. So this <coughs> makes an ensemble of vectors. And you can just compute the rank of these vectors. And this gives you the dimensionality of, um, of your substructure. So it can be 2D. It can also be 1D or even a cluster if you don't find any periodic copy. So we can get any kind of, of substructure with any dimensionality. <clears throat> so since the algorithm is, in essence, simple, it can deal with many complex situations. Uh, uh, um, because it's very general. So for instance, you can get things that are uh, with a stacking axis, not along a crystallographic axis. You can get such structure where the layer really spans a lot of adjacent unit cells, so you really need this atom here and this one here, uh, as well as the unit cell here. You can get also these kind of things where uh, the layers are really interleaved, 
and there is no kind of vacuum you could define here, so you really need to look at individual bonds. Or also such a complex structure where you have clusters between layers. <coughs> um, when, when you have done this, algorithm, this purely geometrical screening, you want to go a bit further and put a bit more physics. So the idea is to, to try to split such a 3D structure and see the, the energy of interaction between the layers. So uh, here you need an ingredient that is not given for granted in DFT calculation, which are van der Waals interaction, because most of these compounds are holding only through van der Waals interactions. So you need to use van der Waals functional. We have chosen two. I will show later a posteriori uh, that they work well. Uh, the two we have chosen are the DFT with C09 exchange and RVV10, but there are many more. And actually, I, I doubt that it would change uh, significantly the, the results. Um, so the, the other ingredient also that you need are good pseudopotentials. And here I, I would like to insist also on another work that we did in the lab, which is uh, to, to compile a, a library of pseudopotential. We did not do them ourselves, except for one exception. But essentially, we collected all the possible pseudopotential libraries testing them compared to all electron calculation and testing conversions until we get for each element kind of the best pseudo potential. So this is the SSSP, which is available uh, on the web and, uh, and it's highly reliable. So uh, a few words about the functionals that, that we have chosen. Uh, if you look at the structural parameters of these, uh, of these uh, compounds computed with DFT, if you do not use a van der Waals functional, and if you look at the error in the interlayer distance, so the out-of-plane axis, if you want, versus the packing ratio, so the lowest the packing ratio, the more empty is your structure, if you want, you see that there is a big spread, uh, there is a big a systematic error and, and a big spread in the error. Now, if you instead use the two van der Waals function we have chosen, the spread is much reduced and the systematic error is almost absent. So this gives a first confidence of what we are doing, but you need a bit more because we are going to compute energetics, binding energies. So we also compare with, uh, with state-of-the-art reference uh, uh, binding energy from RPA, which we did not do ourselves, but they are coming from here. And um, on these well-known layered compounds, essentially, the difference in binding energy is not it, not only it's not very uh, uh, significant, but also, well, it, is a, it has a certain magnitude, but let's say the the compound-to-compound uh, compound, um, difference is uh, more or less the same as the RPA uh, with the van der Waals functionals. So we are pretty confident that we can use the van der Waals functional also for the energetics. And uh, that's what we did in the end. But only the binding energy is not completely enough because it's a bit arbitrary to fix a threshold uh, below which you will say, uh, okay, those are van der, Waals, uh, lay, uh, van der Waals bounded and above they are not. So we try to find another descriptor, uh, which we choose to be the, the difference in the interlay distance between a non-van der Waals and a van der Waals computation. So if you want, if you take a, a, a function like RefPB that is supposedly and probably very approximately van der Waals free, um, you can say that those uh, van der Waals bonded compounds shouldn't bound and uh, the, the interlay distance should grow kind of indefinitely. And um, versus something that contains van der Waals that will bind them much tighter together. And that's actually what you see. So for small binding energies, which are on the y-axis, this difference in percent is very big and grows for, that's graphite actually. Uh, while um, when the binding energy is much bigger, yeah, the, 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 this delta is much smaller. So in the end, we have three regions. We have identified kind of three regions. One is quite clearly the region of easily uh, exfoliable materials. Here, the yellow one, we think they are clearly not exfoliable, or at least uh, with difficulties. And in between, there is this intermediate region, which we are not really sure of, but, but the mining energy is still relatively small. So they may be uh, exfoliable. We, we think that there is still some, some possibility to exfoliate them. So um, let me summarize where we are up to now. 
So we have done the geometrical selection on uh, more than 100,000 structures from, from external databases. So this gave uh, 5,600 layered structure, which for some of them, actually more than half of them were relaxed. The others, it's still ongoing, or they are really much bigger, so it's more, it's more complicated to do them. Uh, then we computed the binding energies on those. We exfoliated them. We ended up with 1,800 1, monolayers. And uh, we can go further with these, identifying prototypes, which I will show, doing structural relaxation and computing some properties on the most promising um, uh, materials. So this is what I will show now. Let's begin with some statistics. Um, it, so if you look at the distribution of point groups among the layered materials versus those of the standard the, the 3D databases, it's quite striking to see that actually there is no real preferred space group, uh, point group compared to the external database, except for very few exceptions. Uh, I like this way of looking at, at this, where you really see that actually low symmetry point groups are very present in layered materials. So it's not only hexagonal or trigonal, uh, there are really lots kind, all kinds of things. Um, also, uh, with the, the structure, we did the, some prototyping, the 2D structure, so we took about 1,000 of these structures and, and tried to identify using Pymagen and the structure matcher of Pymagen some prototypes. And um, so the most common one, those are the 10 most common. The most common one contains 67 structure. It's the cadmium diodide. It's also the 1T phase of uh, MOS2. But you, so that's not surprising if you want. There are others that are more surprising, like this tritelluride that contains a rare earth, or even this quaternary compound that is also quite well represented. Um, now, maybe you wonder if these structures are stable. So um, to, to evaluate uh, the mechanical sta stability, which is the first step, we, uh, we computed the phonons. Now there is, there is a catch here, which is for, for 2D monolayers, one has to be careful. The, the typically, one uses 3D periodic boundary condition with a big vacuum between the layers. And in some cases, it's, it's not good enough, even with a very large vacuum, you, because you have long-range Coulomb interaction and the periodic images interact. So fortunately, there is a 2D version of the DFT code Quantum Espresso now with the truncated Coulomb interaction. So that this has been developed by Thibault Soyer. Um, and this allows, for instance, to get prop, the, the proper LOTO splitting, or I, I should say maybe the, the absence of splitting, because so that's boron nitride, that's the high part of the phonon dispersion. And in 3D, you have really a splitting between LO and TO, while in 2D, the, the LO mode actually bends down until it reaches the TO, and the only thing that is discontinuous is the, the slope, actually. So with this code, you can get this right, which is quite important. So now, how do you deal with uh, with uh, stru with uh, stability? So, the idea is to to to, do, to relax the two D structure to compute the force constant and then to look at possible uh, unstable phonon at gamma. So, meaning imaginary frequencies. And if there is one, you try to distort the structure to follow the instability. Uh, and you use this as an initial guess, and you go back here and you do it again. So. We use SPGLib, uh, the, the library from Atsuhi Togo, to, to perform this kind of things and uh, symmetry analysis. And this allows to go from a situation like this, where you have really a highly negative phonons at gamma, to something like this, where this is well stabilized. So in the end, we, we have uh, 245 uh, phonons. Actually, now we're computing more. Um, and let me now make a small parenthesis, uh, because up to now, I, I talked about results, which is the thing that happens in the project at the very end, actually. And uh, before this, this, uh, this end, there is all the technical stuff you have to do. And let me say a word about it. So uh, all of this has been, I would say, made possible thanks to the platform AIDA, which you have heard about, which is one of the flagship code. And, and AIDA is about really dealing with uh, all the calculations you want to put uh, on a cluster that you want to launch on a cluster, and most, most importantly, also storing all the data generated by this calculation, storing the provenance of this data. They are linked together, so you have a structure that gives a calculation that will give another structure, for instance. So you have, uh, in the end, some graph, some, some trees. 
it's also an environment where you have really um, connection between different kinds of codes, for instance, ASC, SPGLib, PyMagen, they are all, uh, you can all use them within AIDA. And mo maybe most importantly, the, the sharing. So all that we do in AIDA, the workflows we develop, the data we generate can then be easily shared with other people using also AIDA. So this is really the, the, the key tool in, in this study and in Marvel at large, I would say. So let me show you an example of workflow that is the phone dispersion workflow. So it's a, a workflow to begin from a structure, compute the dynamical matrices, and then get the phone dispersion. And uh, in this, actually, you have lots of sub-workflows. So the structure relaxation first, you need to go through several relaxations until you, you're sure you have reached a convergence. The dynamical matrices, you have to do some initialization, then you compute, for each Q point, you compute a separate, uh, uh, you use the pH code of quantum espresso. Uh, and actually, all these are also workflows that are really low-level workflows that deals with all the, the restart management on a cluster. The fact that maybe your calculation can fail for some external reason and just need to relaunch it, or there is uh, the CPU time that was reached and you need just to continue it, this kind of thing and even some, some small logic to, to change a little bit the parameters to make it work. So um, this is a quite complex workflow, but then for the user, it's simple to use. And actually, uh, recently with Giovanni Pizzi, we have developed um, a Phonon Turnkey solution, which I can show. I hope you can see something. But anyway, so essentially you choose a structure, and uh, you, you choose if you want to relax it, you choose the computer on which you want to to compute, and um, so this is really a small hub that you can readily use. You choose the pseudo potential library, you choose some K points density mesh. There is also some advanced options like the smearing or this kind of thing. And then you generate your input and you just have to click on a button to run the workflow. So after that, you'll go to some uh, status uh, uh, app that will show you what has happened. So now I skip some of the waiting part. Uh, and uh, now it's finished, and you see the result right away also in the same application. So there is the band structure and also the phone on dispersion. So now, uh, you, if I tell you that this is so easy to use that a, a kid could, could use it, maybe you would not believe me, or maybe you would say this is just a nice sentence. But it's actually true, because what you've just saw has been performed by my 10 years old daughter. She, she did it uh, uh, on the computer without even, uh, let's say, I mean, the, the closest thing from a computer she used to use was a smartphone, and uh, she did it very easily, so she computed the phonon dispersion of, uh, of aluminum that way. Up. So, uh, let me go back a bit to the properties and more to the perspectives of, of this study. So, um, after, uh, after that, we computed the magnetic and electronic properties by uh, scanning possible ground states, so both ferro and antiferromagnetic configurations. And uh, this is a plot of the mag absolute magnetization in Bohr magneton per unit cell versus band gap. And those are the materials that we found. So I indicated the strongest ones, all those that are insulating, which are very in interesting. So in red are the antiferromagnet, in blue are the ferromagnet. Um, you see also some chemical trends, like uh, the manganese compound, the vanadium compounds, uh, or the chromium compounds here around, uh, also the nickel here. So, um, so all this uh, is going to be actually published in, in one week from now, on February 5th, in uh, this Nature and Technology paper with all the, the co-authors. There are also the electronic structures. So this is uh, just 258 electronic band structure. Those are effective masses. The color indicates the thickness of the layer, and the size indicates the, the band gap. Uh, that's the work of David Campi, who is preparing a, a paper on this. And we also search for topological insulator. And actually, uh, we found one, actually, Antimo Marazzo. Uh, found one, and there is a, this archive paper here. So it's based on the acuting guide, which is actually a known, uh, as everything in this study, it's a known 3D bulk compound that has been discovered in Brazil. 
So let me, before concluding, let me uh, show you all my, my co-author, and really I would like to thank all of them because uh, what they've done was really crucial. Uh, I would also like to thank the, the founding uh, partners and the computing time from CSCS. And now I will leave you with my summary. So we, we found uh, essentially more than 5,000 layers of material with a geometric screening. Then out of them, uh, almost 2,000 easily exfoliable structures. Uh, not, not easily, but exfoliable structure among which 1,000 should really be easily exfoliable. Uh, we did all this with AIDA, which co keeps the provenance of all calculation and is easily shareable. Uh, now we, we are computing phonons, magnetic, electronic topological properties, and all this data is going to be in the materials cloud. It is actually now available in, in the materials cloud and in this DOI here. So, and as I said, there is a, a nature nanotechnology in press that is going to be out uh, next week. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks.